or verses or just words of encouragement. We're going to have open, uh, have the mic open here. Uh, and uh, I want to give even you sisters liberty for this occasion to come up here to the mic and to share something with them. Uh, families or brothers, anyone that would like to share, please do use this microphone as they have the camera on it. Um, keep sharing until we're through. Uh, I'm not, uh, we'll, we're not going to worry about the clock. We'll just adjust things as we go as we need to. So, all right. I'll just share a verse while they're gathering around. If I can lay my eyes on it again. Psalm 145, verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. Know that we can still say that. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. There are times when we don't understand. But we, we don't question God. He is righteous. He, he is holy. And then the next verse says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. And God has a plan from here, even though we don't understand it. Uh, we don't see it at this point, but God does have a plan, and it will be beautiful when he uh, fulfills it.
this time, I would like to invite anybody who has been to Tanzania to sing a Swahili song. Mungoni Pendo, it's a very familiar one to those of us that have been there. So anybody that knows it enough to sing it, even if you haven't been there, you can come up. And the English translation is the same song as God is Love. Um, right? Yeah. David, are you videoing this? Because Kim says it's quick. Okay. this before I lose courage to each of him his beloved family members and teammates and friends and co-workers whether here in Oasis and in the U.S. or across the ocean in Warren and Kim's big house or in the village of Kawita and in other sections of Tanzania to each of you sincere sympathy and love and prayers for you may the God of all comfort be your portion Each person is uniquely known to our Heavenly Father. Each life is unique. Each relationship is unique. And each death is unique. Not one sparrow falls to the ground without our Father seeing and knowing. I also am one of God's sparrows, which is not demeaning, 
this picture makes me feel loved and protected. Okay. Graham's death touches each of us in different ways for different reasons. Her death touched me deeply, not because I had the privilege to know her. We are an ocean in a cultural way. But she played an integral part of the mission that we support in word and in deed and in prayer. <clears throat> and what matters to every one of you in the Tanzania mission matters to me. Roma's death touched me deeply because, also because of my family history. Her death had no warning, and neither did my youngest brother Kevin's death 16 and a half years ago. Both were young and in the prime of life, and neither had a sunset to their lives. Her death awoke the memories of a searing pain of loss and separation, the unending numbness that sat in alongside and with the pain, and the deep vulnerability of our fragile lives. However, being each loss in relationship is unique, I am not pretending to know and understand the uniqueness of the grief journey that each of you are on. <clears throat> we can't know why some things happen, but we can know that love and beautiful memories outlast the pain of grief. And we can know that there's a place inside the heart where love lives always. May God bless each and hold us close to his heart. In vain our fancy strives to paint the moment after death, the glories that surround the saints when yielding up their breath. When gentle sigh that fetters breaks, we scarce can say they're gone. Before the willing spirit takes her mansion near the throne. Faith strives, but all its efforts fail to trace her in her flight. No eye can pierce within the veil which hides the world of light. Thus much, and this is all we know, they are completely blessed, having gone, done with sin and care and woe, and with your Savior rest. On harps of gold they praise his name, his face they always view. Then let us followers be of them, that we may praise him too. Their faith and patience, love and zeal, should make their memory dear. And Lord, do thou the prayers fulfill they'd offered for us here. For they have gained, we losers are, we miss them day by day. But thou canst every, every breath breach, repair, and wipe our tears away. We pray as Elisha, in Elisha's case, when great Elijah went, may double portions of that grace to us who, who stay be sent. We sorrow along with you, uh, Rahim is parting. We don't see the whole picture as God does, but we trust him. Our thoughts and prayers are with you all and the children. We love you. I have a short poem here. She has put on invisibility. Dear Lord, I cannot see, but this I know, although the road ascends and passes from my sight, there, that there will be no night that you will take her gently by the hand and lead her on along the road of life that never ends. And she will find it is not death but dawn. I do not doubt that you are there as here and you will hold her dear.
Warren and Kim, my heart goes out to you. Death is a really painful time, but I'm thankful that we have the God of all comfort to comfort your hearts. I have a poem that meant a lot to me at the death of our son. It's called Passing Through, and it's from the scripture Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. When thou passest through the waters, deep the waves may be and cold. Jehovah is our refuge, and his promise is our hold. For the Lord himself has said it, he the faithful God and true. When thou comest to the waters, thou shalt not go down, but through. Seas of sorrow, seas of trial, bitterest anguish, fiercest pain, rolling surges of temptation, sweeping o'er your heart and brain. They shall never overflow us, for we know his word is true. All his waves and all his billows, he will lead us safely through. Threatening breakers of destruction, doubts insidious undertow, shall not sink us shall not drag us out to ocean depths of woe for his promise shall sustain us praise the lord whose word is true we shall not go down or under he has said thou passest through so you're passing through a really difficult time but you will come through it because god is your refuge may god bless you Where grave thy bed? 
want to have a few words with you, Warren and Kim and Joanna and the children. I want to know, know that we are praying for you every day. Our thoughts are with you. And we think of our God who is sovereign. We think of his mercy. We think of his grace. And we try to understand these things. And we, we can't bring the two ends together except that we know he has said in his word that um, I'm getting a mental block. All things work together for good to those that love him who are called according to his purpose. That is a promise. It's not just a promise for us, but it speaks of the character of our God that in life's uncertain circumstances, the character of our God is not in question. And we have not gone through ever what you are going through, so we cannot completely relate, but we are praying for you. May God bless you. There's a poem that I wanted to share. Um, it's the lyrics of a song that I've listened to um, frequently this week. It's titled, In Deepest Night. In deepest night, in darkest days, when hearts are hung, no songs we raise. When silence must suffice as praise, yet sounding in us quietly, there is the song of God. When friend was lost, when love deceived, dear Jesus wept, God was believed. So with us in our grief, God grieves, and round about us mournfully, there are the tears of God. When through the waters winds our path, around us pain, around us death, deep calls to deep a saving breath, and found beside us faithfully, there is the love of God. I really wish you weren't came, I could be with you right now. Um, but we're definitely praying for you.
two verses from Psalms 91 I'd like to share with you. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. That's my prayer for you, Warren and Kim, and your family during this time. That you could find yourself dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And I picture that you know, as a place that is close to God, that is trusting, that is resting in Him. And that is peaceful because of trusting and resting in Him. You know, in situations like this, we don't know why. We don't know why God decided to take Rahima. You know, and it, you know it's tempting to ask, you know, why God? Because we can't, we can't see why. But, you know, we can trust that God has a plan that God knows what he is doing because of who he is. And it's just my prayer for you that you can find yourself resting and trusting in him. God bless you. to read a few words here from the Apostle Paul. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Morning, Kim. You have our love and prayers. And it's just thinking about it here as people were sharing back when we served in Grenada I think it was actually after we came home and one of the men that had um, come to the Lord and we thought he was great potential for leadership in the church one day disappeared at sea and was never seen again we couldn't understand why God allowed that and it's easy to question but we know God has a plan and his plan is always best. Um, yeah, just back in February, his sister-in-law died, and um, we were given a, we got a CD that there were many songs on there that ministered to me, and I'm going to read the words from one of those songs. It's called Mountain of Sorrow. You turn to face the morning, You can feel the rain before you even look outside. Through a cloudy window pane, you're reminded of the way you feel inside. You cry, God, I can't hold on. Will time never heal the wound? I feel I can't hold on another day. When a mountain of sorrow leaves a river of heartache in a valley of darkness that you don't understand, take the high road to heaven at the crossroad of of Calvary to the refuge of Jesus lay it on his hands and let it go you're the life in every crowd but inside you're on an island on the sea hollow empty words fill the time but don't always fill the need Jesus knows your pain he'll go with you all the way there's nowhere you'll go today he hasn't been When a mountain of sorrow leaves a river of heartache in a valley of darkness that you don't understand, take the high road to heaven at the crossroad of Calvary to the refuge of Jesus. Lay it all on his hands and let it go. God bless you. Kim.
Ben and family and also the Rahima uh, friends and family. Uh, we're, you're in our thoughts and prayers. Um, I have a verse here in First Thess- Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How can we do that in a time like this? How can we do that? How can we do that as a people of God? We can do that as a people of God. Because even at the beginning, when man brought death to himself, to all mankind, God made a way. And he made a way for us to have hope in him and a beautiful life forever. And uh, even in death, in the death of a friend, we have that hope um, that we can be with him forever and it gives us hope for the future. We're going to sing a song about how we can bless the Lord even in all circumstances. And uh, I brought my my uh, paper along my my printer along this morning cuz we're going to use this to uh, sing. Can you see children? Okay. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, out. Turn back to praise when the darkness closes in, Lord. Still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. As you well know, this month, 17 years ago, we also laid to rest a loved one. And I'm sure the questions come why, but uh, may you find the grace to not ask why, but to trust God, he is faithful. We share this praying that it would bring comfort to your grieving hearts. We share this for Warren and Kim and their dear children and for Joanna and for Heather. 
We never had the privilege of knowing Rahima, but we're very blessed with her testimony that she left behind. She had a beautiful servant heart. And we're grateful that you are not grieving as those without hope. Today I can picture her walking on golden streets, holding Nathaniel's hand. Uh, this verse was very dear to me in our time of grief, Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Jesus care when my heart is pained to be free for mirth and song as a bird in stress and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long oh yes he cares I know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares to care. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shade, does he care enough to be near? Oh, yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares to care. Does Jesus care? When I said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me, and my sad heart is still it merely breaks, is it all to him does he see? Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long Nights dreary, I know my Savior cares to Hello, Warrens, Kim, your family. Tears are a language God understands. And David was in a low time in his life. And he tells, tells God, put down my tears into thy bottle. <clears throat> and God returns back to you with these words about his bottle of tears. Dear child, I know that you're weeping. Your heart is so wounded and sore. I feel every throb of your anguish and the tears that can trickle no more. And I'm putting them into my bottle to save till the judgment day when those who on earth have been faithful will have all their tears wiped away. Dear child, I am touched by your hurting such pain that has clouded your view. I know the temptation of doubting my love as you weep the night through. But I'm putting, my, putting your tears in my bottle. Those teardrops of heart-rending heart rending woe, they are seeds for your rapture in heaven. Only then, their sweet fragments you'll know when you trust God for the coming days.
you for all that have come and shared. Um, we've all been touched. Um, I suppose there's no one else that's planning to come forward. Don't want to cut anyone off. Brother John, why don't we say a word? We close in prayer, and uh, then I'll take our offering. Warren, Kim, we just want to close this part of the service with prayer for you. Our hearts are with you. Father, we, we come to you in Jesus' name as we bring this part of the service to a close. As we have remembered those who are grieving the loss of Rahama, as we have endeavored to share in their pain. Father, we pray that you would bless and comfort them. That you would make a way before them. That you would bless their hearts with your peace and joy. And that, Father... As there are many unknowns in the future, would you be the one to bring the solutions to those unknowns? <clears throat> Father, again, thank you. Thank you for the testimony that Rahama left. Thank you for the opportunity to have known her distantly, not in person, but through others. And Father, her, her chapter of life is completed. Grant us, Father, who are remaining to be faithful until our time is completed. And again, we ask a blessing on Warren and Kim. Be with them and bless them and keep them. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Are they still connected? Let's sing uh, There's Coming a Day. Josh, can you lead us in that? There's Coming a Day. I didn't find it in the book, so we'll just sing a verse or two by memory. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more cloud in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. 
When I look upon his face, the one saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parching over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Now we'll shift gears a little bit. Um, we're going to, I'm going to give the order to the rest of the service. We are going to skip the children's lesson this morning because of time. And we are looking forward, we are looking forward to hearing four testimonies from four young people. I'd like to encourage them that we love to hear testimonies. And so we're looking forward to that. So we'll be listening, we'll be uh, giving them opportunity next for that. And after that, Brother, uh, well, then we'll have the <coughs> offering and so on. And then Brother uh, Matt will be up here. And a little later, Brother Don Diener. So I think I'll give the order right now. We'll have Justin come first and then Kenton and then Elizabeth and Natasha. <laughs> oh, it's Justin, right? Not Justin. So I got it right. Okay. So uh, if you come up in that order and share what the Lord has done for you, that's a blessing. So uh, may God bless you. the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve to die, but Jesus gave his life so we could live. On January 2nd, I was tired of sin and felt I wasn't safe, so I talked to my dad when I got born again. I commend my life to God. I would like to be part of Oasis Christian Fellowship. If you see anything in my life that I need to work on, you can come and talk to me about it. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I want to thank God for his mercy in saving my soul on February 27, 2018. God used the book Mom was reading to our family at story time to convict me. The person in the book had given their heart to the Lord and was going through instruction class for baptism. There was a good bit of scripture shared in the book and explaining of this important step. I was pretty certain God was calling me to make a commitment, but I waited till the next evening after we were finished smoking. I came in, took a shower, and sat on the sofa feeling miserable and lost. I asked Mom to come so we could talk. 
She said, we will wait till dad com comes in from the barn. When he came in, we went to mom and dad's room and talked. I confessed my sins, prayed, and asked Jesus into my life. I felt relief and experienced peace. I, went, I would like to be a member here at Oasis. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Good morning. Um, starting at about 15 years old, I knew that I would have to become a Christian sometime or else go to hell. I mostly thought about death and spiritual things at night when I did think about it. Um, there were two times that I thought about and almost did become a Christian. Once when a friend had a bad accident and became a Christian himself, and another time when I dreamed that the world ended. Both times I waited till the next morning, pushing the guilty feelings away, but knowing I would have to make the decision sometime. I also knew I was guilty of death. Finally, after about two years, an experience at school gave me the final push of courage to talk to my parents. I told dad and mom how I felt, and they prayed with me and went over the process and meaning of salvation. After praying and confessing my sins before God, I felt at peace, and I knew that if I would die, I would go to heaven. Life isn't always easy, but I know and can feel that God is with me, and that if I trust him and am surrendered to him, he will direct me. And I can continue to have peace. I would like to become a member here at Oasis, so if anyone has questions or concerns or something they see in my life, please come talk to me. I want to be a blessing to y'all, just as y'all have been a huge blessing to me. Thank you for everyone that was praying and is still praying for me. It means a lot to know that people care that much about me and my spiritual life. Thank you. Psalms 13.5, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. On September 25, 2018, I was having a pretty grumpy day. Later that afternoon, I talked with my brother on the phone and was telling him some of my troubles when he made this comment, he made, when he made this remark. You will never be truly happy until you change. And that comment made me very uncomfortable. The night as I was laying in bed, I was deeply convicted and the thought of dying really scared me. After not being able to sleep, I finally went down and talked to my parents. After I'd prayed and confessed my sin, I still did not feel at peace, so mom and dad prayed for me and we sang and read from the Bible. After that, I felt at peace. I would like to become a member of Oasis Christian Fellowship. If you see anything in my life that would not be pleasing to God, please come talk to me. God bless. Thank you. And uh, all the rest of us have given, given an extra responsibility for those young souls to pray for them, be an example to them, encourage them, and uh, help direct them. Okay, at this time, we will have the lift the offering. We'll have a song as we lift the offering, which is for HIM, the Harmony International Missions. And after that, then Brother Matt, you can come up and and share what's in your heart. May God bless you as you give. That giving, as you look in scripture, giving is a part of worship of our Lord. So may God bless you. Let's turn to number 401. Four hundred one unto the hills. I picked this song, kind of um, thought it fit, um, just as an encouragement to those getting baptized. And if Warren and Kim are on, still listening, um, can be an encouragement to them. Four hundred one unto the hills. Oh. Unto the hills around do I lift up my longing eyes. Oh, whence for me shall my salvation come from whence arise? 
From God the Lord doth come my certain aid. From God the Lord who heaven and earth hath made. He will not suffer that thy foot be moved, safe shalt thou be. No careless slumber shall his eyelids close, who keepeth thee. Behold, he sleepeth, not he slumbereth ne'er, who keepeth Israel in his holy care. Je Self, thy keeper true, thy changeless shade. Jehovah, thy defense on thy right hand himself hath made. And thee no sun by day shall ever smite, no moon shall harm thee in the silent night. From every evil shall he keep thy soul, from every sin. Jehovah shall preserve thy going out, thy coming in. Above thee watching, he whom we adore shall keep thee henceforth, yea, forevermore. morning. God bless each one here this morning. It's a blessing to be in God's house together and share in this way. You know, when we become a part of the family of God, it's, it's like becoming a, a part of any family. You're, you're there for the good times and the bad, and you're there to share in the joys and the sorrows. And um, they don't always uh, get mixed on the same day, but I guess uh, we have experienced that here this morning, and um, it's it's a blessing uh, to be able to to share together that way, and know that we're not alone, and that that God is with us, and um, and also to have these uh, things to to rejoice in and to celebrate this morning. Uh, thank you, each one of the young people, for sharing your testimony. Um, it's uh, just a blessing to, to see God's work in your life and, and to look forward to what he has for you uh, in the future together as well. <clears throat> I'm going to share for just a little bit here this morning, and then uh, I'm privileged to have my dad here and have asked him to share as well, so um, we'll have maybe uh, two short messages or uh, inspirations for you this morning. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you again at this moment. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence this morning. Thank you for each one that's here and each one that's gathered here in heart from around the world. Lord, we thank you for um, comforting our hearts Thank you, Lord, that you're with us through the deep waters, and you're always there, and you see, and you know, and you feel, and uh, you care about us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to, to comfort the hearts this morning that are hurting. And, uh, Lord, we also thank you for your work in the lives of men and women, 
and young people, and thank you for the, the four who gave testimony this morning of your work in their hearts and for the step of baptism that they plan to take this afternoon. Lord, we just uh, praise you for that, and thank you for Jesus Christ and for your plan of salvation, and that we can be a part of your family. Lord, I pray that you would give each one of us hearts after you and help us to be faithful to you in our walk and in our testimony for you to the world around us. Lord, please speak to us this morning through your word and uh, help us each to hear and learn and grow from what you would have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I have um, just a few things I'd like to share, particularly with uh, the ones who are taking the step of baptism today just to encourage you and um, rejoice with you and talk about what, what the Lord's done in your hearts and, um, and what change has happened in your life. So uh, becoming a, a believer is, uh, is the biggest decision and the biggest change that can take place in, in a human heart and a human life in our time here on earth. But it's not... Um, it's not always um, visible instantly. You can't see uh, a, a drastic change uh, in how you look or um, your, uh, the, the way you're made. You're still the person that God created you to be. So what's, what's the difference? What happens uh, when God saves you and washes your sins away and you commit your life to him? Um, what, is, what is the big difference? What is the big change that, that takes place? And how will life be different from here forward? I'm sure each one of you uh, have had enough days since you gave your heart to the Lord to know that it doesn't mean that you'll never have any struggles anymore, that you'll never have any temptations anymore, that nothing will ever grow wrong again. But hopefully you've experienced a difference in, in your heart and in your mind uh, on how those things affect you and how you can face those things. Um, what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to think about this morning is is how our lives are changed when Christ comes in. Christ comes into our heart, and I'd like to turn to Colossians chapter one. Just read a passage here, and I will try to keep this short. I don't want to take too much time from my dad here, but uh, I want to read Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to skip down through, starting at verse 3. I'm going to read down through several verses, so if you can try to follow along. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. That applies to you for this morning. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. You're now a joint heir. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, praise the Lord, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And who is his Son? That's Jesus Christ, your Savior. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We're going to come back to that verse. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached unto every creature which is under heaven. Verse 27, to whom God, 
would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, listen here, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the difference this morning in your life is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm going to go back to verse 21 for just a minute. It says, and you that were sometimes alienated. So what does alienated mean? It means uh, estranged or um, totally removed from. Uh, when we think of the word aliens today, we think of some strange creature from outer space that's not like anything we know um, here, and which obviously um, we don't believe that uh, those type of aliens exist. But an alien uh, means somebody that's not part of this group or this country. We, uh, there's a term that's used um, for people from other countries uh, in related to, to coming into our country. They might say it's an illegal alien. So it's, it's still a human being, uh, just as normal as the rest of us, but they're not from here, and supposedly they don't belong here. Um, so there was a time before you gave your heart to the Lord that when you look at Christ's kingdom and the family of God, you weren't from there. You, you, you didn't belong. You hadn't entered in to the kingdom of God through the, through the door, Jesus Christ. And it says you were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind. What, uh, what comes to mind when you think of an enemy? Well, for me, it, uh, I think of some kind of a battle or a war or some um, uh, conflict. There has to be enemies to have a, a, a war. And it says enemies in your mind. <clears throat> so I know you, um, each of you here this morning, you come from uh, Christian homes, and uh, you, have, you have a need of a Savior. But maybe you, haven't, maybe you haven't done a lot of things on the outside that people would look at and say, boy, that's a wicked person. Um, you know, look at all the, all the wicked things that they do. Oh, well, maybe not, but in your mind, you're an enemy of God. You know, our mind, an unregenerate mind is an enemy of God. And what is an enemy? It's just somebody that's fighting against another cause or uh, side. And I think you can relate to, uh, to the concept that when our mind before our mind is, is cleaned and changed and before Christ is in us, our mind is an enemy against good and against what God wants us to do. Our mind takes us the other way. And we are enemies in our mind by wicked works. The next phrase, though, it says, yet now hath he reconciled. So what is, what is being reconciled? Um, we think about, sometimes we use that word when we uh, think about somebody that uh, has done something wrong against somebody else and they need to be reconciled together, they need to correct that. Um, another, another way we might use it in our uh, language today, or our terminology, we'd say we have to reconcile our bank statement. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, it means that we take our records and align them with the records that the bank says are true. And we, we, we trust that the bank records are true and we need to make sure that ours lines up with that. And if it doesn't, we start to look at where the, where the difference is. But um, when I thought about our minds being enemy, uh, our, our mind being an enemy to good and needing to be reconciled, it's, it's like our mind is, is pointing this way and God and his kingdom is pointing this way and there's, there's, um, there's conflict and uh, there's um, resistance. And to be, to be reconciled, our, our mind needs to be changed. It needs to be turned around to be the same way as, as God's mind and God's kingdom. And I believe that that's what God does in our hearts and, and in our minds and in our lives when we choose to reconcile our life through the steps that God has laid out and the plan that God has made for us to be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. He aligns our mind and our heart with his. He gives us a new heart. 
Justin and I talked about this when, um, when Justin was making this step and this choice was about our heart uh, being, being changed to desire the things that God wants us to desire instead of being opposite of that. And that's why we call it repentance. And it's called uh, repentance means turning around and going the other way. So if you picture your old mind being an arrow pointed this way and God's kingdom being an arrow pointed this way, and then you become born again and you're reconciled to God, your arrow can be turned around and pointed in the same direction as God through Jesus Christ. And you might uh, remember a verse in Philippians that says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that's the mind that's aligned with God's will. He said uh, his desire was to do the will of God who sent him. So then again, verse 27, it told us, said, uh, we're the ones, you're the ones that to whom God would make known. God wants to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ becomes the, the driving force of your life, what's in your heart and your mind and what, what dictates the, the way you live and the way you choose and the strength that you have inside. You know, how could we have glory except it be through Christ? So Christ is in us. Um, just a few other verses I'd like to, like to read over quickly here, and you don't have to turn to them. But put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That was Colossians 3.12. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. When Jesus said um, to take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. Humility and uh, brotherly love is the mind that Christ has and that we should have as we walk with him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Remember we talked about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hope is what you have now, which you did not have before. When you're not walking with Christ, when you're not aligned with his kingdom, you don't have hope. And that's why you can rightly feel hopeless sometimes. But with Christ in you, you don't have to feel hopeless. You have a lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. It's not going to wear out. You don't need to turn this one in for a new one every few years. No, this hope that's in you, Christ that's in you, this inheritance is incorruptible. You who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, and we do too with you. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Remember we said it's not that every day goes perfect from here on out and that you never have a struggle again. There's going to be some. But the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Remember that hope of glory? You can have hope of glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love, keep loving him with all your heart. In whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. I'm praising God for the salvation of your souls and each one of us who have given our hearts to him this morning. The world is desperately seeking what can only be found in Jesus. And your life now is a part of the testimony of how they can find that and where that is. When your life shines with the lasting peace and joy and hope, others can see what it's like when they embrace life with Christ. When Christ guides your day, others notice that your life is different. So they might not take their first look at you after you've been born again and say, wow, something changed about you. Now they might. They might notice a different countenance or a different way you talk or act um, pretty quickly. But when they see you choosing to trust God, even in difficult circumstances, or when they see you 
reacting with kindness instead of anger or building others up instead of um, being proud, uh, living in humility, they can see Christ in you and the difference that that makes. And let your light shine. Let that, let that difference be seen and let that testimony um, be, be evident. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Jesus didn't light your candle so that you can hide it behind something. He lit it so that it can be seen and give light unto all that are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> when you experience disappointments, just reach out to the Lord. He walks with you through the dark valley, and he invites you to a life of joy. When you feel disappointed or, or dejected over your failures, because there will be some, remember that you're God's beloved child. He looks upon you as one made perfect through Christ's sacrifice. That's part of the hope that you have in Christ. God is faithful, and he has a purpose for your life. And he's working all things together for your good according to his purpose. You may have heard that already this morning. But Jesus and God, he's for you today and forever. Thank God that you belong to Christ who lives in you and he made you a new creation. And that's not something to be taken lightly. I think you understand something about the sacrifice that Jesus made uh, as you thought about and considered the gift that he was offering you. I think... Your parents at least uh, helped you think about what it cost, what it cost Jesus, and um, just the, the uh, privilege that we have to accept that gift. But your baptism today is a declaration and a celebration of the work of Christ in your heart, and it's a testimony to, to the world that now Christ is in you, and you have the hope of glory. It's a seal on your life uh, and a forward step of confidence in the new life that Jesus has given you. And I want to bless you today for that and uh, rejoice with you and pray for you as you walk forward with Christ and uh, let your testimony be known to your friends and to um, family and to everyone in the world. This uh, step of baptism is intended to be a public testimony, a public step. Um, and we didn't invite the whole community of Schaeferstown out to the baptism, but we hope that everyone that your life touches will be able to see that Christ is in you. I'd just like to read this verse yet, and then I'm going to turn the time over to my dad. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church and in each one of your lives, in each one of our lives, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. God bless you. We stand for prayer. Father, we stand amazed in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though we are outwardly standing, Father, inside, I trust that our hearts are bowed before you, before your majesty. And Father, we want to say that we love you. And we want to love you more. I thank you for your grace and your mercy the peace that you give us through the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray your blessing. I pray your hedge of protection around this assembly. I pray, dear God, that your word would bring forth much fruit for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I didn't expect what we've experienced here this morning. 
and I've been thoroughly blessed. Life is full of questions. I'm blessed with the questions that the apostles asked many times in the scripture. I had to think of one in particular, Judas, not Iscariot, in John 14. He said, how is it, Lord, that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said, if men love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is a reality. Also, I had to think about many times at school in, in class, as the students get older, we talk a lot about real life. We talk about things that they are likely to face in life. And are they prepared? Uh, we do face things in life, difficult things, trials, tribulations, pains, sorrows, all those things. I want to say to Justin and Elizabeth and uh, the other two that I don't know, but uh, I, I want to draw your attention to what you have experienced here this morning. You've experienced a group of people that are suffering a situation in life that brings grief and sorrow and pain. And yet you've experienced a group of people that have given very clear and very beautiful testimony of the grace and the power of God. Somebody once said in a sermon that the, the, the safest place in a storm, and I have to think about some of those tornadoes in the south, that, uh, that we experienced, and people dig a hole in the ground, and they put this, this thing in the ground. It's a tornado shelter, and it's supposed to be stronger than the tornado. But this preacher said one time, the safest place in a storm is in something stronger than the storm. And we have that in Christ Jesus. I like object lessons. I, I didn't bring one today. But you witnessed one today, a real-life object lesson of people in a safe place in the midst of a storm. So for you four young people, I, I want you to meditate on that. And I want you to pray that God would give you uh, the grace that you'll need to walk day by day, to, uh, surrendering yourselves and yielding yourselves to the, to the power of Christ in you. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about baptism. Um, I was blessed with what Matt had to share. I remember the first time that he, as a young man, was asked to share a devotional in church. And he came to me and he said, Dad, what should I talk about? And I said, you're asking the wrong father. And I'm very blessed to see that, that my son takes after his father. But I'm talking about our Heavenly Father, not me. And it's a real blessing to be here also for Justin and Elizabeth. And the other two. But again, I don't know the other two, but God bless you. Um, testimony of baptism. I appreciated Matt bringing that out, the testimony, and that's what I'd like to talk about this morning for a little bit, the testimony of baptism. And if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to start in Exodus just for a minute. You can, as you're turning, you can listen to this account here. This is where Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they're heading toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites, they, they had not grown in, in trust for Moses quite yet. I mean, they're following him because they're, they're looking for freedom, they're looking for deliverance, and maybe there's a little bit of trust there, but they really have no great basis for trust. And it doesn't seem like they had a great basis of trust in God either over these, these years that they had been in bondage. But they had been obedient. They had taken a step of obedience in the Passover, and Moses is leading them out. 
And in, chap in chapter uh, 14 of Exodus in verse 10, it says here, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were afraid. Well, we can't blame them for being afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and that was a good thing. I'm not sure exactly what they said, because the next thing we read here is that they complained to Moses. They said, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? But then we see what happens. Moses brings them to the shore of the Red Sea. And Moses says to the people in verse 13, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Again, he's pointing to God. I am not your Savior. God is your Savior. Stand still, be still, and know that he is God which he will show you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. There's a promise. Verse 14 says, The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Again, good advice for us to remember day by day that it's the Lord that fights for us. The battle is the Lord's. We are to be still and trust in him and follow his orders to move when he says to move. And that's what he does here in verse 21. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst. They took that step of faith, following Moses upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And we know the rest of the story, but now we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and Paul refers to this account. He says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, what does that mean, that they were baptized unto Moses? What is baptism anyway? What happened here, the children of Israel, again, their faith was not strong. And when we are young our faith is not strong. Even sometimes when we're old, our faith is not strong. And we, we continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and grow in faith. And that's what God desires, that we continue to grow. But their faith was not strong, but it was strong enough to follow him. It was partly out of fear, partly out of a desire for deliverance. Whatever it was, all these things baptized unto Moses. What they did is they assumed a position under his leadership. They said, I will follow you. I am trusting that you're leading me to a better place, and I will follow you. They were devoted to him. They obeyed him. They placed under his authority to lead them under the protection and provision of the covenant. Moses was a mediator of a covenant, the covenant of God, God's promises. And by proceeding through the cloud and through the sea, it was a public recognition. The Egyptians watched as these Israelites stepped out into this sea that had been miraculously divided, following this man, Moses. It was a public recognition of their being his followers. And likewise, today, it is a public recognition of your dedication, of your choice to take that step of faith to follow a leader. Now, all your life, all our lives, we follow somebody. Even if we think we're independent-minded and we think we're making our own choices and leading our own lives, we are following somebody. But where is that leader leading us? So you are choosing to enter into an obligation of following a leader. And today is just one step in that following, and it's a public step. It's a public declaration of your dependence upon God. It's a declaration that I'm free, free from the bondage of sin, free from being a servant to sin. It's a profession of faith, faith, but faith without evidence is a suspect faith. Now, the Israelites, they followed Moses into the sea, and we know the story how they went into the wilderness, and their faith wavered. And we can read down here in chapter 10, Verse 5 says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. They started good. They took that step of faith and followed Moses, but then they wavered. 
their faith wavered and they became disobedient and they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So this profession of faith, in like manner, we follow the captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 8, that he, calls, he is called a mediator of a better covenant. So we are not following Moses and the covenant that he was a mediator of, but we are following the new covenant, the covenant that God has established through the blood of Jesus. And so we take this step of obedience by faith. This is just one step you are taking, but it's a very important step. This is a step of choice. This is not something anybody forced you to do, I trust, but it's something that God himself has spoken to your heart and has brought that conviction of sin into your heart and has drawn you to himself by love and has asked you to make this choice to follow him. And you have made that choice. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. So you are choosing. You have chosen. And this day you are making public expression of that choice that I am choosing to serve God. I will serve the Lord Jesus. It's a commitment. It's a dedication. It's a consecration. It's a confessing allegiance. You know, people in this country, they pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And we could go on and, and recite what they say to that flag. And what does that mean? That means that if called upon, they will do those things necessary, even unto death sometimes, to defend the Constitution of the United States, the government of the United States. Well, we do the same thing, and we pledge allegiance to our leader, to our King of Kings and Lord of Lords, unto death. We are willing to yield ourselves and do whatever he asks to defend his Constitution, to defend his government. And his government and his peace will have no end. So it's a testimony that you are becoming a disciple a follower, a learner, the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, go into all the world, go into all nations, teaching them. And, and if you look into the words there, it's making disciples. And what is a disciple? Well, I just told you a disciple is a follower, a learner, somebody who has committed themselves to learn all they can and to follow this particular teacher. So he says, go into all the world, teaching, making disciples, and baptizing them baptizing them. We'll talk about that just a little bit later. And teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So today, Justin, Elizabeth, what are the other two names? Kenton, Kenton and Natasha. Okay. I, I don't want to refer to them anonymously. So Justin, Elizabeth, Kenton, and Natasha. Today, what you're doing is you're giving public testimony. You're saying, today I have come to the place in my life at a previous date where I have recognized my helplessness, my hopelessness, my, my sinfulness, that my nature is a nature of sin, that I was in enmity with God. I was opposed to God, maybe not in our mind, but in our behavior and our life and our actions we had not been reconciled yet we had not been brought back into fellowship with God but I'm giving testimony today that that is true and I'm so happy to be able to tell that I've confessed my sin I've received by faith God's grace and his mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ to the saving of my eternal soul and my heart says amen to his will And I lift up my heart to the Lord Jesus, and I say, Lord, I want to tell people. I want to tell people the wonderful thing that has happened in my life. There's nothing in my life that has happened that has been so monumental, so, uh, so wonderful. We can't even express it in words. And I want to tell people. I want to tell people what you have done for me. I want to tell about the peace that passes all understanding that I now realize in my soul, my heart, that peace and that rest that I find. And God looking down upon you, and, and maybe you've heard him say this to you. Maybe you've heard his voice. That is good, my child. That is good. It is a good thing that you want to tell. And there are several reasons why it's a good thing that, uh, that God wants us to tell. 
And one of those things I'd like to make reference to in, in Revelation chapter 12, if you would turn in your Bibles there, I tell my Bible students at school oftentimes, turn in your Bibles there because I want you to put your eyeballs on this passage. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Revelation chapter 12, one tremendous reason for giving public testimony and to continue to do that is because we are now in a warfare. You have now stepped onto the battlefield and you have enlisted in God's army. In chapter, chapter 12 of Revelation, verse 10, says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Can you relate to this? Now is come salvation. Now has come salvation. And strength. Whose strength? God's strength. And the kingdom of our God, we are now citizens of his kingdom and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. Isn't that what you experienced at that moment of salvation? You have experienced the casting down of the accuser of the brethren, the one that even unknowingly you were following. And now has come salvation and the power of his Christ, strength. Verse 11, how is it? How is it that we overcome the enemy? How is it that we fight against the devil? It says here they overcame him by what? By the blood of the lamb. It's not anything that I can do. I cannot defeat the devil in my own strength, in my own wisdom. But it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you have been washed in the blood of Christ if you have been saved. Justin, Elizabeth, Kenton, Natasha. You've been washed in the blood. And so you have overcome the devil. And then he says, and also by the word of their testimony. Do you realize what a weapon that the word of our testimony is in daily warfare? I, I found I have on my desk at school, I have a little laptop computer that the school provided for me to, to do work with. And I, I really appreciate the old hymns, I do. Maybe it's because I, I only came to the Lord as an adult and uh, didn't have that, that upbringing as a child. And the old hymns, the hymns that were written in blood, the hymns that were written in tears, the hymns that were written in struggle, really ministered to my heart, really spoke to me, really taught me and continue to teach me. And I found a, a site where there's some piano music, some very gentle, in fact, that's what I search for. I, I, I search for gentle, relaxing hymns. And it came up with a couple of hours worth of piano hymns, and they are really very gentle and soft and peaceful. And so I get into school in the morning, and I, I go there and I turn on these, these piano hymns and, and I don't need the words there because God has placed those words in my heart. And so as I sit there doing my work and preparing my lessons, these hymns are just gently coming into my mind, into my ears, and it's ministering. It's a testimony. It's a testimony. The words of these hymns are the testimony of those that wrote these hymns, a testimony of their victory, a testimony of their, their power in Christ. And so they're giving testimony. Even though they're dead, they're yet speaking through the words of these songs. And I'm hearing these melodies and the testimony is just encouraging me and giving me strength for the day. And so what am I trying to tell you by, by telling you that? Is your testimony can be a great encouragement to others. And, and we talked in Bible class the other day, Elizabeth, didn't we, about our testimony doesn't always have to be with words. But we looked at that verse, exhort one another daily. And just our life, Matt talked about our behavior, the way we talk is changing and the way we behave is changing. And just that changed life and that behavior can be a testimony and an encouragement. How many of you are encouraged when you see a brother or sister just walking faithfully and, 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 and doing those things that please the Lord? I am. Yeah, and that's why God has us together. 
so that we can encourage one another, exhort one another daily. And so we see here some of the weapons for our warfare. And so the word of your testimony today, Justin, Elizabeth, Kenton, Natasha, your testimony today, what you shared earlier, and your step of faith and your step of obedience later on, uh, getting into the water. And the water itself, there's nothing special about the water itself. The special thing is your obedience to Christ. And so as you do that, it's a word of testimony. It's an act of testimony. And it's encouraging to us. It is very encouraging to us. So we may say, how can I give a testimony? How can I do that? Well, Philip was uh, drawn to an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot one time. And he was reading the book of Isaiah. And he didn't understand. Well, how could he understand? But he asked Philip, who is, who is it talking about here? And so Philip expounded to him about the Lord Jesus, about the Messiah, about the Savior. And I don't know if Philip talked to the Ethiopian about baptism or if he just understood. See, back then, baptism was a cultural thing. And baptism, the symbol of, symbolism of baptism back then was basically they're, they're coming out of a pagan background, becoming a proselyte or a convert uh, to a certain doctrine and committing themselves to a teacher to learn, to become a disciple. And so it was symbolic of, of washing away the old pagan beliefs and the old pagan behavior and bringing them up, bringing them up out of the water clean. And though the water doesn't cleanse you, your expression of faith and your expression of obedience continues that cleansing by the blood of Jesus and helps you to rise up and walk in newness of life. And so we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm really blessed with, uh, with Philip's answer to the eunuch. The eunuch said to Philip, here's water, what hindereth me to be baptized? And what did Philip say? He said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. Notice he didn't say if you believe with your mind, if you've been intellectually challenged and, and convinced in your mind. We could go to Romans 10, verse 10, I believe it is, where it talks about believing with the heart unto salvation. So what has happened to you for is not that somebody has convinced you that this is right and this is the right way to go, but somebody else, God himself, has convinced you in the heart, in the heart to believe believe in the heart and this kind of belief will change your life will bring forth a new creature in Christ Jesus so it all focuses around the heart today is a special day but it's just one step it's that testimony that you're giving that you're now on a new course you've changed course I really appreciate that reconciliation the, the, the going against each other and now changing and walking marching to Zion. But Justin, Elizabeth, Kenton, Natasha, you're not alone. I want you to look around. Just go ahead, look around you. And you see people that you know, most of these people you know, maybe there's some other visitors, maybe you don't know me very well. I've been here before, but you don't know me. But we're all for you. We all want to gather together and, and hold each other up and, and pray for each other and bless each other. You're not walking this this road alone but the greatest thing is that we're not walking it without Jesus he is with you the hope of glory Christ in you so three reasons why this is an important step of obedience number one it helps you personally this doing what you're doing today is is strengthening for you it's helping you it's it's cementing in your heart and your mind this is something God wants me to do, and so I'm going to do it. And whenever we do something that God wants us to do, if we do it with a heart of love for him, it brings a sense of satisfaction. It brings a sense of rest that I'm pleasing my father. Remember, Jesus said, I do always those things that please my father. And so that's what we want to do now as we walk with him. And so it brings a sense of rest. It's a visible public declaration. We already mentioned that. Another thing it does is it shows others. So these people here, all these people gathered here today, 
Every one of them wanted to be here. And there are likely others that would have loved to have been here today and to go out to that pond and to watch as you give testimony of your love for Christ and your, your dedication to him, your commitment to him, and go through the act of baptism. It, is, it encourages them. It's an exhortation for them. And the third thing it does is it puts the enemy on notice that I am no longer following you, but I have changed allegiance. I am now walking after my master, and I will do everything that I can to serve him and to resist you. James, in chapter 4, he says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. So hopefully you're catching some of these encouragements and some of these scripture things that, that tell us how we walk in victory. We draw nigh unto God. Resist the devil because he will come after you. He will still continue to tempt you and entice you and lie to you. But the truth always prevails over lies. So it puts the enemy on notice. Baptism is a symbol of a life full of outworkings. It's one thing. I would like just for a couple minutes to turn to Romans chapter 6 and look at a couple of verses here that talk about this symbolism. A couple of very familiar verses. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul had just been telling the Romans that God has grace enough grace to deliver us from sin to cover our sin and so the question is so we want more grace do we sin so that the grace can be poured out actually there is a way to get grace and it's a way that we don't often think about but Peter tells us who God gives grace to and uh, James does also I believe who does God give grace to the humble that's right the humble so, you know, I used to pray, God, I need grace for the day. I need grace for this. God, I'm facing a difficult thing. I, I need grace. But I came to realize that I was, I was actually praying. There's nothing wrong with that prayer, but, but I pray, God, help me to recognize my need. Help me to recognize that I can do nothing without you. Help me to recognize, Father, and that this is humility, recognizing that I am nothing recognizing that I can do nothing, recognizing that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but Christ in me, the hope of glory, is my strength. He is all I need. And so that recognition, that, that acceptance of that fact is humility. And God gives grace to the humble. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer than therein? Verse 4, types of baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, walk in newness of life. I had to think of the account in John chapter 12 where the, the Greeks came to to Andrew and Philip, and they said, we want to see Jesus. We, we've heard about him. We'd like to see him. And so they came to Jesus, and they said, there are some Greeks here that, that would like to see you. And Jesus, as, as he typically did, he answered in a way that maybe sometimes we got to stop and, Lord, can you explain that to me? I, I don't understand. But he answered them, and he said, accept a corn of wheat, fall into the ground, and die. It abideth alone. And I had to think this morning about your memorial service. And I had to think about the young lady that God took home. Young. Uh, we wouldn't choose those things. And I heard testimony of several that have lost children, lost loved ones young. And we don't understand those things. But we have faith. We trust God. 
and it was a blessing to hear the scriptures that you recited and the songs that you sang of faith in God and dependence on him. And maybe, just maybe, as that corn of wheat, who you all know as Rahina, that corn of wheat, as it fell into the ground and died, may just somehow, some way, bring forth much fruit for God's glory. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. It's a type of being buried, a type of dying to the old life, a type of dying to sin, a type of dying to the, to the path I was walking on before. That like as Christ was raised up in newness of life, we also walk that way. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall. And this is a wonderful promise of God. God is so gracious, so merciful to give us promises. And we just need to hold on to these promises. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection a new life in Christ. Verses 17 and 18 yet, but God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. There's the heart again. You have obeyed from the heart that calling, that knocking, that God was knocking on your heart's door, that form of doctrine that was delivered to you, but being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So being freed from bondage to sin, from being freed from serving sin, we are now free to serve again, to be servants. Paul many times called himself the bond servant, the bond slave, the servant of Christ. I am so thankful that I can be a servant to the Most High God. And God help me to serve him better and better day by day. And I trust that's your prayer also. So we walk in newness of life, recognizing who I am, that I can do nothing without him. And yet the promise that he gives is that we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. So as we humbly come before him, surrendering ourselves, looking to him for salvation, for the strength day by day, Justin, Elizabeth, Kenton, Natasha, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our dear sweet Lord Jesus, again we bow ourselves before you. Acknowledge that you are Lord. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And dear Lord, I pray for each one here, but I pray especially for Justin my dear grandson, I pray for Elizabeth, one of my dear students. I pray for Kenton, a dear brother, and Natasha, a dear sister. I pray, Lord, that they would hear your voice, they would feel your loving arms around them, they would experience and know the love of Christ shed abroad in their hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would keep your hedge of protection around them and that you would rebuke the devil in Jesus' name and help them to walk in victory day by day, giving testimony of the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has and continues to do in their hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.